It's already recording. Dear friends, today I have brought together 12 poets of significant standing on the Indian poetry scene. One always gets some flack over the use of such, um, you know, editorial expletives as major. I've titled this 12 major Indian poets. So this time is no exception. I've already been getting some flack for this. So I just want to say this by, by way of a brief kind of preamble. Uh, by a kind of broken logic, people often assume that when you say these 12 poets are major Indian poets, that you're saying that these are the only 12 major Indian poets. And they, they you know, folks go asking, what about this person? What about this person? And so on. This is not meant to be exclusive. Uh, however, the selection today, the selection of the poets is a matter of my personal taste and naturally there are other, also other significant Indian poets writing in English today, not even to mention other languages. But rather than give you lists, let me announce that I intend to conduct a series of Indian poetry readings and I invite you to stay tuned and uh, to st stay tuned for them in social media. By the way, my Twitter handle is Fulcrum Po, F U L C R U M P O, as in poetry. And uh, these announcements will appear there as well. And now let me mention briefly that my friendship with Indian poetry goes back some 35 years. For example, I first met K. Sachidanandan, who is one of the readers today, uh, when I was 20 years old in 1986 at the in a, an international forum of intellectuals in Moscow along with other in, eminent Indian poets. And I have known most of today's participants for a good number of years now. Uh, but this is not about me, so I'll keep my framing commentary to a minimum. Um, and uh, the readers will be reading in alphabetical order. So we start today with Amit Chaudhary, a famous uh, Indian English language novelist and literary critic, essayist, and poet. He divides his time teaching at the University of East Anglia and at Ashoka University in the Indian state of Haryana. Welcome, Amidda. It's great to see you here. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see everybody. Um, or at least see the names of a lot of people and faces of, of people I know. Um, but do you want me to begin? I mean, should I start? Yes, please. Something? Please. Okay. So, um, I'm going to read four poems. I, I hope I don't overrun my seven minutes uh, in doing so. Um, I'll begin by reading something from uh, my first uh, book of poems, St. Cyril Road. Um, so this is a poem I wrote uh, 35 years ago. So um, I still hadn't begun, or maybe I'd just begun writing A Strange and Sublime Address at, at that point. Uh, I, uh, I was in England at the time. I was, used to come and visit my parents in the last place they lived in, in Bombay, which was Sincerel Road in Bandra, after my father retired. And for the first time I was writing, I began to write poems about an actual place, rather than try to write poems like, you know, the wasteland or, or whatever. So, um, so this, this is called the Bandra Medical Store. And for me, the, the, the kind of um, frisson of writing the poem might have come from the fact that I was able to write about a place such as the Bandra Medical Store. Forgive the, the poem and its imperfections. Remember, it was written by somebody who was 23 or 20, 24 years old. Um, the Bandra Medical Store. When I first moved here, I had no idea whatsoever where the, where the Bandra medical store really was. But someone in the house was ill. So I ventured out, let my legs meander to a chosen path, articulate their own distances. I guess my going out for medicine, even the illness were just excuses for me to make that uninsisting journey to a place I hadn't seen. Two roads followed each other like long absences. The air smelled of something not there. Branches purled and knitted shadows. There was a field with a little landslide of rubble and a little craggy outline of stone. I drifted past heliotropic rubbish heaps, elderly white houses, an aircraft hummed overhead. 
And did the houses look like rows of slender barley from the pilot's window, row pursuing row held in a milieu of whiteness, unswayed by a clean flowing wind? Then the plane donned a thick cloud. All it left was a cargo of loaded silence. I supposed that I must be lost. It grew evening. Trees fluttered in the dusk sow like winged paleolithic moths eddying towards the closing eye of the sun. I asked someone, do you know where the Bandra Medical Store is? The directions he gave me were motionless gestures scrawled on a darkening fresco. I stepped forward, intentionally trampled a crisp leaf, which then made the only intelligible comment of the evening. But I took care not to squash a warrior ant that scuttled before me. He was so dignified, so black. Had I been smaller, I'd have ridden him back home or off into the sunset. Um, now I'm going to fast forward, like, I don't know, 20 years later or 30 years, uh, no, yeah, 30 years later. Um, this is a poem from a collection called Sweet Shop, which maybe came out a couple of years ago or a year ago, I can't remember. Um, and um, this poem is, I mean, the poems arise from uh, trips I made to North Calcutta to, to, to take some pictures of the the portraits of sweet shop owners in North, uh, in North Calcutta sweet shops. So the poems kind of emerge from that and, and, and sweets uh, are, aren't the kind of only thing that occur in these poems, but, but uh, that's how they began. So this poem is about actually a cousin of mine. It's called Shamul Da. Da is the word that Bengalis used to refer to an older brother, an older person of the male gender, um, Shamul Da. Shamulda, you had possibly traveled over a thousand miles when once on our way to Rishra, pierced by hunger, you chose to stop the car and alight for a sweet. Hunger impelled you to those windows behind which around hard shondish and the ooze of chom chom and the yellow puddle of rubbery, a haze of insects were hovering or swimming or climbing as on an island without a human being. The ants, though touched by the mishti's resin, had laboriously freed themselves to ascend slopes. The flies, enlarged by these environs, banged into each other. I asked you how you brought yourself to eat a specimen from that tray. What if there's something on it? And you laughed like a girl and invoked the Bengali imperative of hunger, evidently more Im immediate than sorrow. I would flick it off and eat. You waved away in a gesture, the invisible living creature, as if dismissing some stupid universal decorum. Um, now the last two poems are from a forthcoming book uh, called Ramanujan. Uh, it'll come out, in, I think in May in the UK, it will not come out in India. Um, so I'm just going to um, minimize this zoom thing and go to my computer to read these two poems. The first one, in Shall fact, I is enable called, screen sharing. Um, I don't know. How, I could do that, but I, I'll, I'll enable it for everyone as an option and then uh, um, let it be available. Um, if you do that, of course, then people can read what I'm reading out. Um, only if you share, if you choose to share your screen, it will not automatically share it. Okay, uh, I, I can share it. Um, it's, it's up to you. I'm just trying to remember how to do it. Okay, uh, it says share screen at the bottom. So that's the way to do it, right? Yeah. Oh, it's already uh, enabled. I, so I it's now some host disabled participant screen sharing. So let me try again. Oh, and if it, if it doesn't work, then I'm just going to read it out because, you know, we've had interesting delays uh, already. Okay, yeah, sure. Go on. Go back, uh, to the general entertainment. Uh, of these delays. Should I just read it out? Yes. Yeah, please. it's not it's not happening, so I'm just going to read it. Um, yeah, Ramanujan. It does this uh, the, the name uh, refers to the mathematician, not the poet. Um, 
Mahesh would cycle or simply stride to the Broad Street Wimpies to get himself a bean burger. I should say that this is a poem that remembers student life in Oxford. So I'll start again. Mahesh would cycle or simply stride to the Broad Street Wimpies to get himself a bean burger. With a wisdom not expected of a Tamil Brahmin from Delhi, he claimed it would suffice. In Balliol, the alternative was jeweled Brussels sprouts and carrots in remnants of lukewarm water. On, on good days, they, the vegetarians, might stumble upon sauerkraut or steaming cauliflower or gratin. You, Hiraman, chose to forage weekly up the Kauli road for turmeric, rice, and chickpeas and potent jars of chana masala powder. In the co-op, you'd spotted yogurt. It was chickpeas that kept you alive. In hall, you scrutinized the mash. Poor Ramanujan, 70 years before you, he must have been the first meat abhorring Hindu to conjure up from odds and ends, no spices then in Oxbridge, no curry leaves, hardly anything even for ordinary Englishmen in a time of conflict and rationing, a semblance at odd hours of night and day of an aroma that half pacified the voice that asked, why are you here? And now the last poem, which is very short, is called Shondesh Mold. Um, this is uh, a, you know, a response to a, a report about the dismantling of the Guru Shodha Museum in Calcutta. It still hasn't happened. Guru Shodha had, uh, Dato had, had collected lots of artifacts from popular culture in that museum. Uh, among them was, was this kind of Shandesh mold, a mold in which you make Shandesh. Furtive as a seahorse or something that's danced underwater to a current outside time and light to survive as residue. One approach, another as corpse of fish or mango, yet another with the submerged finality of a seal. Each form shakes itself free to swim away. Are you then cradle or exoskeleton? Are you finished or about to begin? Thank you very much uh, for having me here. Thank you so much, Amidda. Um, and we go on to our next reader, who is Keki Darwala of Delhi. He's the author of numerous books of uh, poetry and fiction, and he also writes a strident political column. Welcome among us, Keki. I look forward to hearing you. You have to unmute yourself. Is Keki with us? Yeah, I can see, KKG, I can see you, but I cannot hear you. You have to unmute yourself. It's in the left, in the uh, left hand bottom corner, the microphone icon. Yeah, can I, am I audible? Yes, there you are, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read the prologue on my island poems I wrote quite a few, and the prologue came later. I don't want to go into the history. And the book was published in the year 2000, Light River. A poem is an island in itself. Heartburn and frostburn lie outside the page. The outer sense field lacks all relevance. The dying planet's pyrotechnic rage. The busty's fingers round the forest's throat leave these dialectics to another age. Time here is slow as coral, thickening in its thickets each year an inch wide. Time reduced to basics, sundown, star set, as the sea ebbs and surges and the winds ride, islands invent their own prosodies. Slow down your blood beat to the rhythms of the tide. Don't probe 
uh, poems, timber, temper, pace. All island poems fall more or less in line. The various colored sea laid out in panels, the slowing down of time to the tide's receding beat, stars circling soundless, the sun slouching through a zodiac sign. Offloaded here in time and outside time, as we know it, the islands fell in place. Hump flowering with forest, beach seething in sand. Someone must hold a poet's hand in this blue space or he'll go overboard. Extra words are weed words that will leave their rot iron pigment on his face. Salt burn, sunburn, and in its own good time, the poem peels off from the moment and the place. And the second one from the same book, uh, again, a sequence of 10 poems on Mandelstam, and I fiddle with the poems. Uh, and this is Silent Homer, Roaring Sea, also rhymed. Half of it is uh, Mandelstam himself. When the soul is in ferment, time panels slide. Past and present mix vividly and then pale. Homer and insomnia go well with the night and your mind starts voyaging through a taut sail. Disparates interlock, midway through the ship's log, Crete and Atlantis float across your mind. Then the eye homes in on a flight of trains, strung out and elongated in design. A skin that crosses borderlines below, where the kings of Hellas stand drenched in fog. Where do you sail to? Minus Helen, Troy, is just a hulk of stone and timber log. You find yourself between Homer and the sea, both moved by love. Homer, of course, is dead. That leaves the tide to knock at your dream door and seethe and surge and thunder to your bed. Uh, I, sorry, uh, Creek Vases is my favorite from my last book. Uh, Naishapur and Babylon. And I went in, I went to Toronto and walked around a museum and uh, much later wrote the poem. On the red and black vases and their amphorae, the equatorial bulge of their amphorae, a spearman setting out, one of them about to climb onto a one-horse chariot. When soldiers move, one knows their travel plans, long sapping marches through scrub and marsh and deserts from where the oases have fled. Till one windy night, they come upon an escarpment overlooking a plain embered with campfires, Trojan or Turk or Persian, and know in the pit of their hearts that the next dawn means enemy horse and steel. But we are circling black bars and amphora and find the spearmen clad in armor and their spears etched on the baked memory of clay. Spears longer than the lines of Homer or the chronicle of Callisthenes. Behind them are tearful women, wives and mothers, always in black, as if already in mourning. Lament and prophecy, Trojan women, Andromache and Cassandra clamber onto the vase 
without being there. Do I have uh, time for two two short poems? Please go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Well, this is a a, a sequence of metaphysical poems. The archangel is holding a meeting on the earth and uh, heaven sends a reporter to let him know what is happening here and the reporter has been seconded by the ib i'll read the first and the third sonnets that's all things are and he's reporting now to god things are not hunky dory on the border archangel black diamonds in his eye sockets was in the chair meeting call to order all reb rebel angels cozy in his pocket a nitpicking south indian was also there scratching his dhoti that flapped over his privates archangel preempted him by speaking first this virus brings good news for other primates we need to pat ourselves and raise a drink to friends rhinos are thriving indians call them ganda hyenas are doing well strength lies in numbers indian broke in sir how about agenda simple said archangel we are not fussy we just want an end to democracy and i'll read the uh, the second also why not what about secularism the indian asked cleaning the oka sambar from his lips those particular about being secular have fled transition has been smooth streaming without blips secular system you do what you wish beyond belief loudspeaker for any god you adore pinned to temple wall you can hunt or fish my defiant army won't buy this for sure zoom and webinar both by us invented have helped limping mankind to come to terms with life sounds hugs and kisses living we have dented phone call from hell boilers turning cold fire one says lucifer then ponders i have an idea these indians have cast fever higher ones and the last one i'll just read the third and the, the by now the reporter is fed up and so he breaks out in in song himself the officer asked to record record these trifles couldn't contain himself punch spilling over belt swore fealty to god and grey mantri who held the rifle started prayers with ib crawling all over his belt Oh Dios, Jehovah, Osiris, Ra, I'm lost for words. Wish I had a dagger. It's handled toward my hand, as Cervantes da said in his poem Macbeth. I simply stagger at Satan's arrogance. Can you believe it? Someone asked, "Are we allowed to fiddle with the machines? We'll just stack the votes. Liberals won't know whether to crap or piddle." Lucifer broke in. Get them right. The priorities first fix the wretched minorities. Thank you very much, Nikhil. Thank you, KKG. Um, our next reader is Ranjit Hoskote. Ranjit, are you are you with us? I am, Philip. Hi. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Ranjit uh, is an Indian poet, art critic, and cultural theorist. as well as an independent art curator and he lives in mumbai uh, he was honored with the sahitya academy award for lifetime achievement in 2004 and he has published five poetry collections including new and selected poems 1985-2005 and central time welcome ranjit thank you so much philip it's really a pleasure to 
be here to adapt uh, Geki's image uh, to be present and reading at this meeting convened by the Archangel Philip on Earth. And uh, also brief note, uh, there is no Science Academy Award for lifetime uh, achievement. That's a mistake somebody put into my Wikipedia page. But uh, yes, uh, it's been other Science Academy Awards that I have in fact. Uh, one. So what I'm gonna do uh, is to really read from uh, this new book, which is about a week old. It's called Hunch Prose. So I'll just turn. Uh, share a few poems. And again, following Keki's Mediterranean meditations, I think I might start with a poem that's called Homer. And it goes like this. What was his crime? Tell them at home he was taken hostage by his own fictions, trapped by the snake-haired girl who froze her neighbors, or waylaid by the one-eyed clown who hurled rocks at the sea. Say he did all he could to save his sailors from getting their snouts in the cat woman's trough. A schooner snags on the burning horizon. A winning horse breaks the slate line between surf and rain. The voices he'd known crimsoned up as one wave. He thought he'd go blind among the lamp shadows flickering on the cave wall ran out to the wharf. Eyes on the sand, he crosses the currents to where a girl sits on a bench playing a flute. He'd been trying to catch the late haze of sun on the retreating tide, the sourness of plum on a sailor's tongue. The ache of waiting for a boat almost killed him. Wasn't enough to craft a coral shield a quiver of stings. He will grout himself together from wind, rock, foam, and this island whose name he doesn't yet know. He's been strapped to the mast for his own good. Tell them no one is safe from the hurricane of the story. This one's called Pilgrim. Did I ever think heaven would ripen its doors before their right season, expecting me to arrive any day now, my boots caked with mud, my coat weighed down with rain, my lips moving to sounds not tethered yet to chants more hostage than pilgrim, telling my story in bursts, how I let rivers surge through the trenches, how a thrown knife pinned me to a farewell, how I shrugged myself loose and ran, a banner rippling in and out of air, my hands burning with colors I'd scrounged off rocks, shrubs, spiky trees on my way here, leaving my palms on outcrop and leaf, my soles on creased water, This next one is called Town, and it is about the same town that Amit knew at one point in his life, and which I know, and uh, uh, pretty much the same suburb that both of us spent some time. Amit was here for a while. I've lived here all my life, Bandra and Kar. This is Bombay, but it could really be every city today in the new India. Town. In this town, Ask for directions in whispers. Tell no one your birth name. Say you're on your way to nightfall. Buy more bread than you'll eat. Read the signboards forwards and back. Mimic the rare songbird hiding in a bush. Stride along the pipeline bridging the creek. Shuffle off the linen strap on the Kevlar. Play infidel on the hill. Believer on the beach because one blue is so much closer to us than the other. On your knees in the sand, and when it's time, pray you'll come back as pearl thread surf, not driftwood in this town. Following from that does, by the way, seem to be a rare songbird or, or a seabird of an unknown species 
<laughs> yes, as Anand suggests, possibly ducks qu are quacking somewhere. Uh, this next poem is called Nemanim. And it follows from this sense that, that, uh, that shadows many of these new poems about what we're doing with ourselves, what our sense of a shared history has come to and how we're increasingly moving towards apocalypse, not to put too fine a point on it. Nemanim, say that one word that will bring back itihasa, tarikh, historia, one valise in which all the saved generations might find a cracked eyeglass, a thumbed magazine, a toothbrush. And I'll end with a poem called Hawk. Caught up on the wave of the past, a hawk skirls back, ripping the seamed and sutured scar of our passage. Its wings are lined with scripts no one can read, but everyone brawls over in this city of howling dogs and winning saints. The blood that spurts under its claws is common, the sort you could smell anywhere, the sort you can smell everywhere. Suffer us all, dear God of many names, to come together and feed ourselves to that insatiable beak. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ranjit. Um, that was great. Um, our next reader is KVK Murti, who has been, you might say, a secret weapon of Indian poetry for a long time. He lives in Bangalore and now has a, a volume of a select, a selected poems, which are otherwise uncollected, a forthcoming sometime soon. Uh, from uh, Copper Coin, and I gather that there is no title yet. It, it is yet to emerge. Murtiji, welcome. Are you there? Thank you for that. Thank you for that uh, fulsome uh, uh, introduction. Um, I won't uh, spend too much time on uh, preliminaries. Uh, my first poem is a poem about my favorite metaphysical poet, uh, Andrew Marvel. It's called A Glance at Marvel. Not disdain, but in quiet knowing, your orbit's reach swept beyond common eyes, beyond the limited lenses of mere stargazers. The firmament was for lesser lights, the vain ones content to sing the lesser senses. For you were one with gods, your distant sights set on divine tongues, a remote austere speech. Not flourish nor conceit, but a cavalier insouciance marked your passage through worlds, lives, and time, mocked the grave's seclusion, gravely making love to coy mistresses, an ear cocked for wheels and grime, and in jewels strophes, an eternity glimpsed above the running sun, above the dark empyrean's effulgence. The second poem is called Cleopatra. All else notwithstanding, and it wasn't much by mores of time and place, history finds for her. One can see her juggling brothers, wooing Rome, looking for ominous signs from the less kindly disposed others who viewed Alexandria as a touch. Not easy too, her bit of cheek on the Tiber, flaunting sun complete with sire's name. That needed nerve. From their villas, the wives watched like hawks as she came in triumph to shake an empire's pillars, silk and steel, entwined in her fiber. But she was doomed. Fate would intervene with the Ides, and with her patron went whatever Egyptian wind that bore her sails. Actium did the rest. She was spent. She came home to asps and the tales clung like onions to embalm a queen. The third poem is called Uphill. You wonder what drove them, not the pace certainly, 
adequate though it must have been, by the time the campaign was underway, that factor must have ceased to mean much, with their patron dead and a second gone likewise. Leaderless, and God knew how many leagues unreckoned between them and home, with few of any maps to get them there, save a listless westerly drift through stone, marsh, and desert, their plight grave from thirst, flesh spared to bone, hope must have seemed a profligacy, a tasteless jest, bereft of motive power. And so they slogged on with little mercy from sky or sun, an army gone sour. One hardly knows who first went up the hill and gazed unbelieving at that streak of distant blue. But their pent-up cry still rings, a poignant economy of Greek. Narcissus. The first time was surely enchantment, or perhaps witchcraft, given the spell he cast on himself. The pool stretched taut in timeless stillness as he bent over the glazed perfection for which he fell. That, at any rate, was how the myth was wrought. It endured, and certainly, it must be admitted, longer than the subject's startled self-love. The latter was ephemeral at best, an infatuation, by definition unrequited, since the image could not rise above the limbo of that watery palimpsest. <clears throat> Inevitably, the first wavers of doubt ripples through his mind. He grew worn, distray, a shade walking through a curse, given to hearing voices when he was out. He sat down, a droop of brooding bone, eyes sunk in holes, unseeing in mirrors. This one... Uh, was written in 2013. It's called Ricardus Rex Tertius. Five centuries and some have told of you and monotones of red to bloodier red, your immaculate armorial rose incarnadined. Every schoolboy knows those princes, or at least what you're said to have done to them, and the few particulars of your being, the hunchback most cited. For the rest, or really almost all of your brief, brutal progress, there's little beyond that textbook destined battle, the last king, etc. And your comic, unhorsed cry, owed to a meretricious Warwickshire hack. Far from history to ages, white smocked golds pick at your cleaved skull and bones with subtle knives, measure the darking spine, precious now as treasure. Autopsies to show these were king once. A horse at last? Well, at the very least, a rose. And my last poem is, in fact, the my most recent poem. This was written, uh, I think, about six months ago. I think August, if I'm not mistaken. It's called After Rembrandt. Two gazers commune here, the dark air heavy with ages. The hand, lightly resting, seems to sob a sorrow. Despair, perhaps, fixed in that sightless stare. There's no speech, the silence suggesting a te shared tenebrity, a moment briefly destined. The burger richness of the robe, chain and all, is no slight of ancient Attic indigence. Its wearer's look says as much, wearing pain too, if one is so minded. And then again, that homage to the older presence, discerned but just in that dim luminescence. Yet unbeknownst all beat, for it's not fate anachronizing here, but another eye, the third, less fettered by time or date. The head lifts, a stiff leg shifts a weight maybe, arm and brush arching high to hint that gap. The last daubs whereby the whole would hang complete. As for what he thought, we do not know. Another among many such, probably. Outside, the trot of hooves and cobble would have brought home the quotidian. And we, we reprise the long known, the old masters that were never wrong. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Murtiji. I next give you Vivek Narayan. Uh, his books of poems include uh, The Life and Times of Mr. S and the forthcoming after a writing through Valmiki's Ramayana. Vivek, I guess this has come out already, right? I can't hear it's, you. It's, it's coming out next year. I see, I yeah, see. Spring 2022. 20, uh, thank you for explaining that. Yeah, yeah, okay, so my information is correct. It will be published by HarperCollins in India. Um, and the New York Re Review of Books in their poet series. He teaches creative writing at George Mason University and is an old friend of mine. Welcome, Vic. Thank you, Philip. And um, uh, nice to see all of you. Nice to see all of you that I've known for years. And, um, you know, it's, it's reassuring to know that we're all still here. Um, okay. Um, so I, I thought I would read a, a new poem. Um, I, Priya Sarukai Chabria had um, asked, I think so, probably some of you as well, uh, to write poems for this anthology for the Dante centenary. Um, uh, and uh, his divine comedy. So uh, if the Dante is considered by many to be one of the um, pillars of the Western uh, canon uh, written in the early uh, 14th century. And uh, it has, um, Dante just called it comedy, he didn't call it divine, but it has um, uh, inferno, hell, purgatory, and paradise. Um, and uh, we were asked to write one poem for each of these or one section for each of these. Um, and I'm gonna read you those. I'm going to read, I'm, I decided to do it in reverse order. So my poem goes paradise, purgatory, and then ends um, in inferno. And I also um, brought in, I kind of mashed it up with the last two books of the Mahabharata. Um, it's actually much shorter. The last two books of the Mahabharata are just a, cup, a few pages long, but basically they detail the journey of uh, the Pandavas and eventually just Yudhishthira and um, a dog that follows him uh, into heaven. And, and there were many echoes, so I ended up uh, mashing those things together. Uh, and the poem is in Terza Rima, which is a kind of three-line um, rhyming, rotating rhyming form. Um, uh, which is what Dante used. Um, and uh, I didn't quite plan it this way, but each poem uh, came to exactly 31 lines, which means that the whole is uh, 93 lines long. So, uh, you know, Dante and the uh, composers of the Mahabharata were fond of these counting games. So I thought, why not? Um, the other thing is that, that Dante mentions the Ganges twice, in um, uh, once in Purgatory and once in Paradise, um, uh, Gange in Italian. And, um, uh, you know, he, in the Paradise reference, he talks about uh, the Gange and the Ganga and uh, Libra rising, which I guess is an astrological reference, but also a reference to uh, the scales, you know. Um, uh, there's been something done on, you know, Islamic sources for Dante, which makes sense for, uh, you know, a work written in Europe in the early 1300s. Uh, but I think the Ganga is, also, is a small but also crucial part of uh, Dante's geography. Um, now, for Dante, pagan poets didn't get to go to heaven. Uh, but we have to also remember that, you know, perhaps his greatest guide uh, is a pagan poet. Virgil. Um, so um, just a reminder again, so the poems are in reverse order. So uh, paradise will come first. Three poems on the Cantice of the Commedia written through the Mahabharata's last journey. One, like Yudhishthira and his dog for paradise, first dragged through a hell where his enemies had been given time to rejoice in their misdeeds. Or Dante gone to where Beatrice frees him, only after the descending circles had penetrated Earth's core and after the breeze of a limbo that had combed and made continual ripples 
in the emanations of beating heart. Sequence was the key to heaven's scruples. Sequence is what I've purposely taken apart to know the movement of these bodies with the indifference of their own light in the dark. That which occurs here tarries elsewhere, and that which does not occur, occurs nowhere else. Threw myself in flurries to search for eternal calm, bore the worst indignities. Faith is that thing born from hope and the fiercest, cruelest imagination. There, in the pursed light, evolving, nucleosynthetic, came an open start so complete every single star was a name. Token of gratitude, the rush, the farthest sheen of names, and the name of the holy river too in celestial run. Avatar of the historical arts, of grammar, and of the observant husbanded sciences, with the perfection of a poem, but not its fatal tremor. Then the end of all thought was also the coming of alliances. And the arrogant day maker was no longer the sun, the night shepherd no longer the moon in all its glances. Touch was the limit of theory and theory and touch were one. Two, with the pagan poets you'll find me, where else but in a purgatory dawned at the Ganga with Libra on the rise. So scour, if you like, the face for the tells of eternal lassitude, the turning tetrahedrons in the eyes, one pair of upright faces to absorb the black, a second to spit fire back at the sun, and a third, the zebra patterns of dreamed in sleep, and the nose aquiline, intact but humped, fit for villains or emperors or exiles, the lips with a creeping silver camouflage of hair, and on the sack of the jowl as well, a walk to the end. No one skips that. And moreover, the terrain is always uneven, as when the Pandavas crossed a massive peak, a vaster desert eclipsed it. When further on leveled terraces, in tacit agreement with the ascent of the cloud gathering slope, each one by one, prey to their vanities, dropped. Thus Bhima's bereavement that fell first on Draupadi, she, great dark-skinned hope as living ember, who had done no wrong save her partiality to one among them. Then Nakula and Sahadeva, after they'd groped to the next level, gone, simply in result of the childlike pride they'd held in their wisdom and in the beauty of their souls. Then cruelly, consecutively, Arjuna for his pride in having been a hero of the epic. Then spelled in the last letter of the slope, Bhima himself, perplexed, picture of goodness and loyalty, feared paladin, just because he'd love to eat too much. Then only vexed Yudhishthra and the stray dog who'd followed him, that hapless being who was not renounced even by the one who'd renounced all, indexed in the final pages of the land. Hearing and seeing would come to join at that margin. But before that, there was more than time enough for a world still to take full stock of its own engineering, for the pause to appear in the notation, the smoothness to be found in the rough. Three, Inferno. Every king, son, must once behold hell. 
not just as that other place where hair was moss and the muddy ground yielded constantly to the swell of arms and grasping fingers, where the ice, when crossed, revealed its panorama of tear-trapped faces, but all those zones on earth now lost to our tender feeling. All those traces we're immune to or immured from, wherever, whoever, power shall suffocate in its embraces. Ask of these precious remains where they've been procured from. Any underworld secret is the one it mirrors without the benefit of indifference. And the fury of the forum showed in lava split, the sedimented layers betraying the hurt of the past, how in each era persisted the policeman's terrors, known only to the poor and the outcast, how on fancy tables each night we ate the unfortunate ones, teeth clenched on the skull bones, how that much and more held fast to an amnesiac circling guilt over the corrugated dunned roofs of the shanties in the approach to the airport or in the current of an importunate stump of a limb on your skin poached at a light or simply turned from us as we are almost turned away from them, scotched under bridges or flyovers or in the bushes, or even along a coast near the tide line, turning, turning in an endless tableau of sleep. And if time must cook every creature in its own special roast, if time will only pour its bodies as libations into the heaped fire of battle, exhaustion is but the innocence of that dog that follows you. Exhaustion, a simple currency exchanged when you can no longer bear to weep for all that you haven't done and all that you have when it swallows you. Vivek, thank you very much for your contribution and for this Dantian moment. Our next reader is Giv Patel. Giv, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Great. Uh, he's a writer and painter. His collected poems were published by Poetry Walla, an excellent poetry press in Mumbai, by the way. And this book came out in um, 2017. And uh, Mr. Behram and Other Plays was published by Seagull Books in Kolkata in 2007. He has, for the last two decades, conducted an annual poetry workshop for school kids at the Rishi Valley School in South India. And he has also worked as a medical practitioner in rural and urban India. Welcome, Give. Thank you, Philip. Um, am I on the screen? Yes, yes, I can see you. Okay, fine. Uh, I'm going to read uh, about maybe four poems. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, the image of the tree uh, appears in my poems uh, frequently. And um, I find that uh, a, in each poem, uh, Peter's asking me to tilt the camera a bit lower. Um, okay. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the tree image has a different function in each poem. And so uh, I thought I'd read this to explore this a bit for myself. <clears throat> uh, the first poem is called Aegis, the Greek word Aegis, uh, uh, implying uh, under the protection of. And uh, it just is a picture of myself lying uh, under a tree and the various different sensations that I experience. <clears throat> Aegis. I lie an hour under this tree's shade. The time is the height of summer. 
The earth is worked ready for rain. The clods are large, uneven. Not one straw in the field, say nothing of my racked human frame, rests calm and level. I am a ship with crazy joints, passive to the ups and downs of a ploughed ocean. My heels pierced through, shoulders stabbed by stubble, head flung back. Earth fault for a pillow allows the cranium a full free fall, tilting the gaze upward into the tree's blazing crown. Quietly, leaves mediate, straining away sunlight. Earth hammock of my choosing did not bargain for this vision gratis. The arching crown of this tree of middling height sways over me the alternate hissing and silence of a snake's hood. I am a miracle child under a fierce god's aegis. My fixed, twisted head looks up, seeking to urge from the creature's stooping frame a sign of mutual regard, a gaze returned, cast back at me as a pelting of leaves to brush my wrapped, upturned face, seeks to coax one more wave of windswept sound, inaudible almost hiss or whisper of near words to lull me to a quiet, a calm. Should my spirit chill to a fearful premonition of this vision's true intention? In Squirrels in Washington, the tree image appears actually in the latter part of the poem and uh, is connected with the myth of Daphne, the, the forest nymph uh, who is transformed into a tree in order to save her from Apollo's rape. The earlier part of the poem is a kind of a, a cogitation about uh, how close each creative creature can afford be, can afford to be, how close to any other, without the danger of becoming one inextricable mass. So, squirrels in Washington. Squirrels in Washington come galloping at you on fours, then break to halt a few feet away and beg on hind quarters. No one stones them and their fear is diminished. They do halt even so, some feet away. Those few feet, the object of my wonder. Do I emit currents at close quarters? Are those the few feet I would keep from a tame tiger? Is there a hierarchy then of distances that must be observed? And non-observance would at once agglutinate all of nature into a messy, inextricable mass. Ah, Daphne, passing from woman to foliage, did she for a moment sense all vegetable sap as current of her own bloodstream, the green flooding into the red? And when she achieved her final arboreal being, shed dewy tears each dawn 
for that lost fleeting moment that hint at freedom in transit between cage and cage. Thank you. Uh, All Night is one more tree poem. Uh, I think I need to say nothing about it. It's pretty clear. All Night. Someone, someone needs to mute their mic, please. We, we're hearing children's voices inside. OK. Right. Thank you, that's better. All night. All night long, the tree crackling, shivering, hurled right to left and back again by the dark air. It was bracing to wake up at least four times in the night, each time to listen to its fortunes, then slide back into sleep. How is it that another being's restlessness could make me feel restful? The tree's accustomed stately being. And maybe it might even wish once in a while to be tossed about the way it was this night. And I could sense a jubilation, an exultant cry splintering its throat. Sensing the tree's delirium, I was given reciprocal understanding of my own racing journeys, night following night, hair all awry, the wild tousling, sounding screams I never get to utter otherwise. The last poem is called A Variation on Saint Teresa. Uh, The first line of the poem is a quote from Saint Teresa's autobiography. Uh, The line is, whenever you withdraw only a little way from me, I immediately fall to the ground. Uh, I, 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 was, I, I thought it was an amazing line because it talks about her complete dependence upon God to the extent that she says that a, a slightest move away means that she, that she does not exist anymore. And I was very strongly affected by this amazing line. And the rest of the poem is my own cogitation around this line, a feeling of wonder that anybody could surrender themselves quite to this extent and what that could imply. A variation on St. Teresa. Whenever you withdraw only a little way from me, I immediately fall to the ground. I wait upon the strings you hold. In this equation, whatever to make of love and of any independent performance of a glorious kind. My limbs at best may be infused by an outer force. And so inconsolably, I await your storms, screaming seas, ripping gales, Clouds tumbled across the mouths of valleys 
spewing lightning, with trees shaken like rattles in a child's fist. These then, at last, do move me. Yes, I'm moved. Indeed, I am. I am. Thank you. Thank you so much, Give, Give Patel. Uh, and we proceed to K. Sachidanandan, an eminent poet as well as playwright, fiction writer, travel writer, editor, literary critic. He writes in Malayalam and English. A lot of his poetry is self-translated from Malayalam into English. He objects to being called an Indian English poet. I'll just um, mention this to give you his own view of this. Um, he has to his name over 70 original works and uh, as well as 30 books of translations of poetry from across the globe. And he has for many years, he was for many years, the head of the Sahitya Academy, which is India's top literary academy. He has read his poetry and has been published all over the world. Welcome, Sachi. You need to... Uh, that, yeah. Yes, yeah, I, I have one minute, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Yes. And uh, I'm happy to be among the poets uh, whom I have known and read for years. Uh, even though I am older than quite a few of them. Uh, I'll read uh, maybe two or three poems and, and a few fragments, depending on the time available. Birds come after me. Birds come after me as if I were a walking tree. I spread my crown for them like the mushroom in the Russian children's tail growing ever wider to shelter birds and bees from rain. I grow many hands from the legs for the parrots, from the hip for crows, from the belly and the back for the cranes, eagles, kingfishers and owls, and tiny tugs for sparrows and tree pots. The fruit, my head opens out like, tree, like a tree trope, and bats hang from them undefined between birdness and beastliness. My hairs blow some, butterflies looking for honey surround my head like a halo. As I watch, each bird turns into a letter, an alphabet of birds. The wind passes between them. They make many noises, order themselves into lines, resound with suggestions, change places, combine to become something else, sing and tell stories. Vanished hills and forests crowd their memory, dried up pools and streams, roofs and telephone cables with screams passing through them and a scalding grammar of electric current. A tree is a dictionary of leaves, my branches, filled with poems, a history of clouds. I was reading at that point of time, Hans Magnus Ensens Berger's uh, collection of poetry called A History of Clouds. So the, the expression just came in. Well, I'll read a poem which in some sense explains why I write in Malayalam. And then of course, uh, I rewrite quite a few of them in English. The Unknown Tongues. This was written in Spain when Renjit was also there. We uh, we toured Spain uh, reading our poems. And we were in Avila in 2016 in, in August, uh, listening to the many tongues spoken by the pilgrims at the St. Teresa ch Church. Already there was a reference to St. Teresa. I don't know Avadhi or Azerbaijani, Kashmiri or Kurdish, Konkani or Kokboro, Gondi or Kirundi, Bangla or Burmese, Marwari or Malagasy, Mundari or Mandarin, Sindhi or Sudanese, a thousand tongues besides. But I know the tongues of Puku and Gekko, leaves and elves, deer and fish, rain and earth, 
body and wind, sea and sky, flower and star, sun and snow, of mind, of mind, and thousands besides, for I know Malayalam. And uh, a poem called Women, which is a kind of homage to women. Uh, women's Day uh, uh, was just around the corner. Women. One woman walks in a hurry, sobbing, a house with faded paint on her head. One woman goes on waiting at a railway station where no train stops. One woman with a halo of glowworms walks in the dark towards the stars. One woman makes sure her wings are in place before she launches herself into a flight. One woman steps into a cornfield in drought with a rain cloud on her shoulder. One woman sings a song, making a fruit tree in autumn burst into blossoms. One woman glints like a spark of fire in the ashes of her little house set on fire. One woman scoops up her body and flees to the border, watching a fighter jet swoop down. One woman sharpens the letters of the alphabet and pulls out the fangs of the enveloping dark. One woman crosses the door of her house with a bang, walks out and hums a medley on the street. One woman looks at the image of Jesus on the cross and yells in agony, son, my darling son. One woman leaves her man on the panel in Kajuraho and finds her pleasure herself. One woman, her muscles hardening as I look on, turns into a goddess of iron and fire. One woman sharpens her sickle again and again, rubbing it against a rock in a forest stream. One, one woman climbs up a tank and offers flowers to soldiers with the moon's smile. One woman, tired of her life on earth, leaves for space in a vehicle made of her own bones. One man stands aghast on the roadside, too scared to cross the road. And a poem called Walk, Walk. They read like a rap. Walk, walk. Walk, walk. Walk together, walk with the questions yet to find an answer. Walk with a song without a roof. Walk with the picture whose river has vanished. Walk with the last leaf of the felled tree. Walk with the consonants of the proscribed poem. Walk with the blood from the stab wound. Walk, walk along the shade between the hair and the grass, through the fire, between the word and its meaning. Walk in red with the sun's dreams. Walk in black with the moon's solitude. Walk against the wind's direction. Walk across the water's flow. Walk, walk from death to life with a palette of colors. You are the sculptor and you the sculpture. Stop and you will fall. Walk without a pose, like the Buddha leaving the palace, like Jesus climbing the mount, like Gandhi marching to Dandi. Walk on, never looking back. Walk, walk, walk. Sachita, did you accidentally mute yourself? Yeah. yeah, the book did it. Had you been a poet? World just passed by like a cat, its fur rubbing against you. It did not expect you to discover a theory of everything anyway. The dark matter remains dark, even after your entry. This tiny being on this little plant knows only one secret. The secret that secrets are secrets, not that it is no knowledge. Galaxies have been made not by laws alone, but by accidents too. 
like our own small lives. Definitions have little scope then, whether of karma or of Brahma. Our brain is too small, and universes huge, infinite, mysterious, enough for many generations of philosophers. Universes would have been even without us. They are indifferent to our discoveries. Had you been a poet, you would have understood things better, like Kabir, Allama Prabhu, or Hafiz. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Sachi, K. Sachi Danandan. And uh, we have five readers left, just to let you know. So we next, our next reader is Yuyutsu Sharma. Uh, he is a well-known Himalayan poet and translator. He's both Indian and Nepali, and he writes in English, Hindi, and Nepal, and, and Nepali. And he, he is also a globe globetrotter, and he divides his time among India, Nepal, and the rest of the world. His 10 collections of poetry include A Blizzard in My Bones, New York Poems, Quaking Cantos, Nepal Earthquake Poems, Amsterdam, and Annapurna Poems. Welcome, Yuyu. -Yu. Namaste. Am I clear? Can you hear me? My voice is clear? Yes, yes, I oh. can hear you loud and clear. Please go uh, ahead. Namaste, everybody. It's so wonderful to be here today uh, among uh, my favorite poets here. Keki is here, and K. Sachinandan is here, and all others whom I have read uh, uh, since my early years. Uh, it's an honor and fill up. Uh, so I'll begin with this, uh, my favorite poem on, uh, on the mules. You know, in the Himalayas, we don't have roads. So mules or the porters carry the load into the mountains. So this first poem is called Mules. On the great Tibetan salt route, they meet me again, old forsaken friends. On their faces, fatigue of a drunken sleep. Their lives worn out, their legs twisted, shaking from carrying illustrious flags of bleeding ascents. Age-long bells clinging to them like festering wounds, beating notes of a slavery that modernism brings, cartons of iceberg, mineral water bottles, solar heaters, Chinese tiles, tin cans, carom boards, sacks of rice, and iodized salt from the plains of Nepal Parai. Butterflies of the terrace fields know their names, singing brooks, tempests of their breathless climbs. Traffic alert and time tested, they climb, carrying dreams of past peacocks, pamphlets of a secret religious war. Filth of an ecologist trial semen, entire kitchen for a cocktail party at the base camp. Defunct devel development agendas of guilty donors, the West weird visions lusting for an instant purge. Stone steps of the mountains, embossed on their drugged brings like lines of a boated love, scratched on the historic rocks of the water spouts. Starry skies of the dozing valleys know the ache of their secret sweat. Sunny days along the crystal rivers taste of their bleeding eyes. And the greatest fiction of their struggling lives lost like real mules, clattering their hooves on the flagstones, encircling the cruel grandeur of bloodthirsty mule paths around the glaciers of Annapurna. So this uh, poem about Annapurna and the putters. I spend most of my time uh, when I'm not in Delhi or New York in the mountains. So. Uh, you know, everything is so you, wonderful. You, you, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I see that you're, I don't know if it's by design, but we can hear you, but we cannot see you. Have you oh. disabled your camera? It would be great to see you too. I, okay, I'm trying to. Um, I there think is, the, the, the icon should be next to the microphone icon. I think I have two. I, I can see it in gallery view. Yeah, there, oh, is, I see. there are two versions. Okay. I have two. In, in case it muddles up, I have two. two. I, Two cameras on. I see. Okay, so hopefully you're visible somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and the second uh, uh, poem I want to read is, uh, you know, everything is so holy and so wonderful in the mountains. And in fact, we have a name for the Himalayas in Sanskrit. A uh, name is Devadatma, meaning place where soul of the God lives. And Everest is not a Nepali name. 
Nepali name for Everest is Sagarmatha, meaning forehead of the sky, which is far more poetic. Everest is name of this British guy when the colonial times tried to see if Everest is the highest mountain in the world. And they named the Everest after this guy. Uh, so this poem I want to read is called Little Paradise Lodge. And it, it has reference to Devatatma, meaning place where soul of the God lives in the end. You, you, you know, you, I think you should best use the same camera and microphone. You're muted okay. on the camera that's showing. Uh, if you select... Uh, there's some select... technical problems, so I, I have to stick to it. I see, okay. Little Paradise Lodge is the name of the poem. My pen frozen against the daggers of Pandapurnas. And in a blank shapeless plank, chopped from a sandalwood tree trunk and used as a table, I place my elbows and hold my face in my hands. Blinding snows of the Anpurna Ridge, mutually shining in the eye of my mind. I sit in the spacious courtyard of your paradise lodge, deciphering shrill notes of birds in the massy trees. One bird initiates a lilting note like our meeting, while others let loose a racket of breath vessels ending with question tags. Can I stay longer, at least one more day, in your little paradise lodge? Two birds playing in the crimson cherry tree stir a chord that seems like opening up of the blossoms of her bodies. Would you take me away and marry me? But what about this electric whistle? This cicada's constant cheer, cheer, cheer. The struggle of our breathless bodies against the dark suit of the night. The pigeons strutting in the, freely in, the, in your courtyard, cool like exhausted porters, climbing the mule pass in their singing gorges. Their yeah, guts are quen 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 qua. They seem to be using a human language, a kind of hush speech robbers might use. Love, in the courtyard of your paradise lodge, I see silence turning flowers into daggers. A herd of cars shuffles past me in a joyous mood, festival like young girls going to a hillside fair, saying, don't you go away, brother. Don't you go away. We would be back until dusk with presents. A cuckoo passes overhead. It's this thing, ka, ka, ka. Please, do not leave me alone. I'm utterly alone, stuck on the last mountain of the world. And beyond me, just one more mountain where they say a deity lives guarding a tiny Turkish lake. And thereafter, nothing but realm of melting snows which sold the gods lake. Uh, you know, there's uh, so, much, uh, so much fun in the mountains and it's not just going to the hills or to the mountains. There's so many, so many people there in their monasteries and their romance. And uh, so uh, this poem, again, from the Himalayas, it's a love poem, uh, it's, uh, it's called River. And, uh, and it's about someone else's wife, not my wife, which is more interesting. Between your marble shoulders and my hairy chest, river roaring, tears, tears, tears. Between your melving mouth and my center tongue, a night of flames and flesh, flesh, flesh. Between your hefty thighs and my throbbing hands, clouds drunk from the forests of rhododendrons, rhododendrons, rhododendrons. Between your almond eyes and my warm mouth, rain dropping like pearls on the plump leaves of the jungle, jungle, jungle. Between your shimmering skin and my dark hair, grass greener than the greenest parakeet growing yellowish from incessant rain, rain, rain. Between your nights by the important pillow of your husband and my crazed headpiece, a poem of spring that shall fill my deep wounds, sprouting flowers, flowers, flowers. Between your two lips and my fragrant pen, a brain fever bird's crazed cry, mad, mad, mad. Between the sparkle of your teeth and my sleep, a rain coming like a roar of a starving stream in the starless summer gloom of the night night, night. Between your melon breast and thrust of my soft lips, the rage of the river battering its head against the magic mountains, mountains. Between your decisions and my flickering lamps, the river mad, you, you poet, you bastard, go away. 
Uh, I'll read one more uh, from my, uh, uh, as uh, Philip talked about uh, my travels. So, you know, I've, in the beginning, I was pretty afraid to travel, but uh, as I started uh, moving out, there are people out there who, who want to listen to you or who want to talk to you, who want to be nice to you. I spent most of my life uh, in India and Nepal. And in the, in the, you know, around 2003, I started traveling. And uh, they say, you have this uh, great, uh, uh, you know, bank of generosity that uh, you meet with these strange people who, who have been to India or Nepal and they're nice to you because someone else was nice to them in India or Nepal. So this poem for all these uh, people who help me, like people like Philip, who are kind of, uh, you know, generous uh, 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 people who promote poetry. A poem is called Someone Left a Pen. On the first second table of restaurant, Zavati Reuter, Starbucks, Willie's Bar, someone left a pen for me. Someone left a feather, a note scribbled in a language illegible along the stony pavement of a dome, Milan, Rome, Köln. Someone left a page, flash of a naked council on an abandoned shore, Den Haag, Bremenhaven, Southampton. Someone waited for me at night in the garden on a white bent naked, naked like white cat facing the listless sheen of a green pond. Someone left an email address, a card, a name on a scrap of paper in a city bus or anguish on the screeching brakes of an underground train. Someone kissed my dark eyes in sleep as she laid her silvery head on my shoulders, a book in her hand, midsummer night's dream. Someone left warmth of a sun from her lungs, a warm mouth, zyka of a center tongue, Dutch, Deutsch, English, French. Someone offered a bottle of wine, a cigarette, a twig of cannabis, a part of familiar fragrance, aroma of a forgotten paradise, whiff of a wet, wet warmth of a burning bush. Someone left a pen on the palpable tables of my travels. I leaned to pick it up and place it in the black bag of my memory. Namaste. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Yuyu. Yuyu Sharma. Yuyu, where are you now? Are you in Nepal? I'm in Kathmandu. You're in Kathmandu. That's oh, great. Very cold here. Today it's so raining. Far. So yeah. I'm sure it's colder. Here it's about five degrees centigrade. In oh, Cambridge. it's not that cold. It's in Cambridge, slowly Massachusetts. Coming on. Yeah, so it's nothing compared to where you are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our next reader is Menka Shivdasani. Um, she is the author of four poetry collections, including Frazzle, poems from 1980 through 2017. She has edited two anthologies of contemporary Indian poetry in English. Uh, for one, one was for Big Bridge. Oh no, I'm sorry. I guess both of them were for Big Bridge, and an anthology of women's writing for Sparrow. She has also co-translated co Freedom and Fisher's, an anthology of Sindhi partition poetry. And Menke is a recipient of several literary awards and the co-founder of Poetry Circle, uh, which is a, a Bombay, a Mumbai poetry group founded in 1986. I had the pleasure of reading at the Poetry Circle in that very same year, which was my first poetry reading in India in 1986. So that brings back nostalgic memories. Welcome, Menka Shivdani. Thank you, Philip. I thought I would read some poems from different phases of my life, uh, beginning with Crystal, which I wrote when I was 16. And most of these poems would be in Frizzle, uh, which Philip referred to. This is the book, you are seeing it in reverse. And uh, this is Crystal, from my very early set of poems. For all its glitter, diamond is only carbon. Never mind differences in price, quality, prestige. Carbon, they said, was black, ugly. So they changed the refractive index, used it as lead to shoot graphitic holes in paper mass, then realized it could be polished to still greater purposes and made what we call a diamond. 
the softness gradually became hard. Today, only another diamond can cut me. The next poem is my version of a love poem. It's called Spring Cleaning. Both of these were my first book, which Adil Jaisawal had published in 1990. That was your skull on the bottom shelf, staring socketless at my ankle. It was a surprise find among those bunches of old clothes. Once I would have screamed. Now I've learned to discard what doesn't fit and especially all that's ugly. Carelessly draped in a hanger, I found an arm leaning bonily towards the perfumes. In another corner, a dislocated knee. Did you run away so fast you broke your leg? I wish you'd wipe that foolish, toothless grin off your stupid face. You needn't be embarrassed about letting me down. Other men have too, and they didn't disintegrate like you. What the hell does one do with human remains? Should I put them in the waste basket and let the sweeper see? Or struggling under the weight, dump a gunny bag off the beach? You really are a nuisance turning up on a lethargic Sunday. Now go away. When I want to say hello, I'd rather walk up to the graveyard with a sweet smelling bunch of flowers, look sad, and pretend you are still below the earth. The next poem is called Tea Party. And it goes like this. Tea Party. When you and I were about to break, there was no question of a fight over who would take the cups and who the saucers. You spilled over with steam, meniscus rippling with the slightest touch. I, supine on the floor, licked the milk once meant for you. Both of us were China at that point. One of us had been to China too, known the meaning of porcelain freedoms, sniffed red guards. One of us had known the sound of an alien tongue, harsh and guttural as it came from smiling mouths. Our smiles were circular, yours and mine. Yours from the top of the tea and mine below, two halves joined together on separate rims. When we blew at each other, the crockery stayed firm. And who but you and I would know, the liquid moved. No, there was no fight over chipped white glass. The pieces lay upon the kitchen floor. And I, I've moved to tea parties in other living rooms balancing alien porcelain on a frigid farm. And my last poem is a much more recent poem. It's called Silver Sands. It's not published as yet. Silver Sands. These strands of silver on a wrinkled beach light up a foamy sea that stretches deep into the distance. With childhood, youth and all of life's tornadoes lie buried under waters that have turned calm upon the face. I have washed the sand away from my burning eyes and learned to ignore the grains that stick. My feet have dried and the wind is cool upon my cheek. You and I we scratched our stories on weather-beaten rocks. We thought they'd last a lifetime, but the waves that washed ashore took bits of us with every turning tide to horizons we had never dreamed that we could touch. I find you in the clouds, 
and you still turn me into rain. I have left no footprints here, but lightning flashes and thunder breaks the silence. I will return to shore someday, where coconut trees will greet me with leafy arms, and the old fort with its gravelly voice will welcome me home. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Menka. A pleasure to hear you and to see you. Um, and we proceed to our next reader, Arundhati Subramanya, uh, who is a poet, curator, critic, anthologist, award-winning author of 12 books of poetry and prose, most recently, Love Without a Story. She has won, as I mentioned, she has won multiple awards for her poetry. And as an editor, her recent book is the Penguin Anthology of Sacred Poetry titled Eating God. She divides her time between Bombay and elsewhere. And it's a pleasure to have you, Arundhati. Thank you, Philip. Thank you for making this uh, fabulous uh, convergence possible. I'm going to start with uh, the title poem of my previous book, I realize I haven't read some of these poems in a long while. So rather than read from the more recent one, I'm going to rewind. This is a poem called When God is a Traveler. And since we've been talking about journeys today, Keiki, Ranjit, and so many others implicating uh, voyages around the world, it felt like it was time to talk about this journey undertaken by a very particular South Indian God a journey from innocence to experience of his own, a journey that so many have undertaken in world mythology. When God is a traveler, wandering about Kartikeya, Muruga, Subramanya, my namesake. Trust the God back from his travels, his voice whole grain and chamomile, his wisdom neem, his peacock sweaty plumed, drowsing in the shadows. Trust him who sits wordless on park benches, listening to the cries of children fading into the dusk, his gaze emptied of vagrancy, his heart of ownership. Trust him who has seen enough. Revolutions, promises, the desperate light of shopping malls, hospital rooms, manifestos, theologies, the iron taste of blood, the great craters that lie in the middle of love. Trust him who no longer begrudges his brother his prize, his parents their partisanship. Trust him whose race is run, whose journey remains, who stands fluid stemmed, knowing that he is the tree that bears fruit, festive with sun. Trust him who recognizes you, abundant, auspicious, battle-scarred, alive, and knows from where you come. Trust the God, ready to circle the world all over again, this time for no reason at all, other than to see it through your eyes. And I'm going to move to a poem called Home, which was written a very long time ago. And it's a short poem. And in many ways, it uh, anticipates directions in my life that I had no clue about at the time. Home. Give me a home that isn't mine, where I can slip in and out of rooms without a trace, never worrying about the plumbing the color of the curtains, the cacophony of books by the bedside, a home that I can wear lightly, where the rooms aren't clogged with yesterday's conversations, where the self doesn't bloat to fill in the crevices, a home like this body, 
so alien when I try to belong, so hospitable when I decide I'm just visiting. And I'm going to read a poem that I haven't, again, read in a very long while and which I'm tempted to read today because, well, that's what readings of this kind are about, a, a chance to share work that one hasn't read in a very long time. This is a poem called Black Estrus. It's a passionate love poem. And in many ways, it's informed by the Bhakti tradition of the subcontinent in which the erotic and the sacred are just so utterly inextricable. Black Estrus. I could lie against you, mouth on forehead, limbs woven into a knot too dense for yearning, hearing the gossamer flurry of your breath, the wild nearness of your heartbeat, and it still won't be close enough. I could swallow you, feel the slurry of you against palate and throat, ravish you with the rip, snarl and grind of canine and molar, taste the ancestral grape that mothered you, your purpleness swirling down my gullet. And it would be a kind of knowing, but you still won't be me enough. I'm learning, love, still learning that there's more to desire than this tribal shudder in the loins. But I'm not sure I'm ready for it yet. That shock in your daily kabuki of shape and event. Not yet. Not yet that shock of vacancy. And I'm going to conclude with uh, a poem from the recent book. When landscape becomes woman. A moment of shock when one suddenly realizes that parents whom one often thinks of as landscape are actually flesh and blood individuals in their own right. When landscape becomes woman. I was eight when I looked through a keyhole and saw my mother in the drawing room in her hibiscus silk sari, her finger, her finger, fingers, fingers of iced cola. And I grew suddenly shy for not having seen her before. I knew her well, of course, serene undulation of blue malmal, wrist serrated by thin gold bangle, the gentle convexity of mole on upper right arm and her high arched feet, better than I knew myself. And I knew her voice like running water, ice cubes in cola. But through the keyhole at the grown-up party, she was no longer geography. She seemed to know just how to incline her neck, just when to sip her swirly drink. And she understood the language of lacquered nails and baritone voices and words like emergency. I could have watched her all night. And that's how I discovered that keyholes always reveal more than doorways. That a chink in the wall is all you need to tumble into a parallel universe. That mothers are women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arundhatiji. Um, I next give you uh, another old friend, uh, Anand Thakur, a poet of Bombay. Uh, so born in Mumbai in 1971, he grew up in India and in the UK, and he still lives in Mumbai. Uh, his five full length poetry collections, the latest, is selected poems. Oh, so the, late, the latest are selected poems and seven deaths and four scrolls, both published in 2017. He is also a well known Hindustani classical vocalist. Welcome, Anand.
Anand, I cannot hear you well. Hi, can you hear me now? Hello? Okay. Is that better? Uh, is the, you, not enough sound. I've maxed out the sound on, on my system and I still can't hear you. Can you hear me? Cannot hear anything right now. Hello? Try talking now. Say something. Hello? Yes, I think I can hear you better now. But hello is not enough. Keep talking. <laughs> hello? Yes, I can hear you. You can go ahead. Now, can you hear me now? Yes, it's better now. Is that clear? Yes, excellent. Thank you. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I thought I'd start with something I've never read aloud before. Uh, it's a sonnet I wrote just last week. Um, that's how it feels. You claimed you preferred the safety of public spaces to appear at bookstores, a park, a hotel pool. I had grown attuned to your frequent assaults on sleep. Till late last night, you chose to blast the rule and accost me in a room where only you could see me. Your eyes held mine with a stare hell-bent on slaughter. I recall a feverish ripping of shirts, the pressure of nails on astonished skin, but little thereafter, except the sound of the flesh crying out for more. When you bit my lips, I'm certain they bled. You loosened your grip, then rose and reached for the door. A salt lamp quivered in the dark. There, you said. I told you one day you'd get what you've always longed for. That's how it feels to get fucked awake by the dead. Um, I, I just thought of that line in Arundhati's poem just now in which she says she's just visiting and a recurrent theme in my, li in my life and poetry has been the simultaneous centrality and illusory nature of self. So I'm going to read a, a little poem called Glacier, which, which begins with the sense of being at the center of things and then moves out of that. Glacier. One might have been born for such sharp alignment. The white curve of an arch quietly concentric to the bowl of my skull. My knees midway between a pair of columns. The feet of a chair in line with my palms as walls and bookshelves window, ceiling, lampshade, and guitar converge silently around the axis of my spine. Now couched on straw matting and niched in wide spaces, the body might even be a hub of strong forces, a pivot or a nucleus, but for which these walls might give way these rafters cave in. The stone Buddha on the shelf no longer asks me to probe myself. Nor does the jug on the table urge the eye to forage for any meaning beneath its jet black. The smooth curves of its sides would have me stay as I am 
wide-eyed and becalmed by the surfaces of things, willfully arranged to center me. And it might be wise, if I could, to stay true to their will. But I have only to shut my eyes to know at once that I am a vast frozen mountain thawing in the sun. Huge, heaving chunks of me breaking off at random, crashing with a thud into the river below. The strong, single-minded river that is always letting go of itself, that may possess no single center of gravity and knows no direction but downhill and seawards. Um, where do I go from here? Okay. I'm responding to poems I've heard. So Menka has this poem about a diamond, a piece of carbon turning into a diamond. And um, I'm going to respond by a poem in the voice of a diamond. It's the Kohinoor. It has a little epigraph. It was finally forwarded to Queen Victoria, arriving in time to become the prize exhibit in the Great Exhibition of 1851. Bamber Gascoigne, the Great Mughals. This is the last, the concluding poem of my third book, uh, Mughal Sequence. The Kohinoor. Here in this tower, bound by gold clamps to thin walls of gold. I, who am pure mineral, neither mortal nor ghost, remain doomed to abide. Of those who are sent here, only the living escape. I endure the doom of rock. Inhabited by light and never at home. No, never. Never for a minute since I was taken from the stomach of this earth. Except perhaps through the week I dreamed unguarded, unpraised and unpossessed in the waistcoat pocket of a British lieutenant who thought me worthless. Most men who held me beheld only what I showed them. And I saw much that their pride could not begin to see. Though monarch and vassal alike, minion and minister, eunuch and page, cupbearer, concubine, courtesan and queen, only rarely guessed that I was watching. I have seen too many blindings, too many tremblings of oil lamps in mirrored paternal halls usurped by the young, the banishment of music and the nervous weaving of recalcitrant cotton where fountains had leaped and the peacock once danced, too many orgies, too much opium and too much penitence too many depraved flailings in the courtyards of mosques and self-assured mastectomies of prurient goddesses by incensed believing hands to be moved or repulsed, intrigued or deceived. These things I have seen and seen myself too often now in the sculpted faces of mute attendants while ailing emperors clung to me in their slumber, then woke before death, envious of my transparence, but unaware of my gaze, staring right through me with opiate eyes, or eyes vermilion with wine. I, 
who have never cared to be a seer have seen these things and ask only now to be sheltered from the light that can never be mine. Return me to the mines. Carry me back to the dark that scorned me. And I'll end with a very short poem. Um, it's about the only little green patch that seems to be left in South Bombay. But there's also a delightful little Shiva temple over there at Hanging Gardens. View from a Shiva shrine, Hanging Gardens, Mumbai. Seen from this distance through the last hillside thicket left upon the island, now for a moment on the other side of beach and bay, this seething city, its endless skyscrapers veiled behind foliage, its relentless car horns muted by the height, grow suddenly so much easier to befriend. Here distance asserts its ancient equation to sing in praise of where I am is to praise the distance at which cities seem forgiven on evenings like these at the ringing of a bell, their infinite cruelties and unyielding ways. I praise the distance at which cities are forgiven. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anand Bhai. And this brings us last but not least to Mona Zote. She's a poet living in Izol in the northeastern Indian state of Mizoram. Uh, and she, she's the only participant whom I have actually not yet met face to face in real life. Uh, her poetry has appeared in major poetry journals and is anthologized in Dancing Earth, an anthology of poetry from Northeast India and also in the Oxford Anthology of Writings from Northeast, Northeast India and in the Borderlands of Asia, Culture, Place and Poetry. Welcome among us, Mona. I look forward to hearing from you, uh, to hearing you rather. Are you with us, Mona? I cannot hear you. Maybe if we have lost Mona, that would be sad. I just saw her on the uh, on the list of people in this reading. Can someone see her? I am afraid we've lost Mona. What a pity. Um, we had said she was having problems, so but she was on the list just just, yes. a, just a second ago as as Anand was reading. Oh, maybe I, yeah. I wonder if she'll might be able to reconnect in a second. Well, too bad, but I'm sure I'll include her in another reading. She's a, she's a, an excellent poet. Um, my friends, it looks like we have reached the end of this wonderful event. It was uh, great to, to hear you all read. Thank you for your, for your poems and for your vibes. Uh, it, it's great to reconnect. I wish I were in India, I miss it always. Um, and uh, I will now end this reading. And it, you know, the, the, the live link, which we had some trouble with originally was successfully shared on my timeline on Facebook, you should feel free to grab it there and share it from you. And a better version of this will be posted to YouTube. So I look forward to seeing you in the virtual world and the real soon. Take care and be well. I'm ending the, the meeting. Bye-bye.